Right, colleagues, good morning. The PA system's certainly working there. Welcome to the Council of Governors meeting for November. Um, we've got a number of new colleagues joining, or new, a number of announcements regarding recent elections, which, uh, um, if I could, if I could uh, make those. Um, first of all, Martin has been successful at reappointments. Thank you, congratulations. Uh, Chris Burton, I'm very pleased to say, is, is returning as our new staff operational governor, effective on the 1st of April of next year. So we welcome Chris back. So Chris is very experienced and very, very pleased to see him back. Um, we have, although he's not here today, Simon Dobinson has been newly appointed to, from Surrey and Sussex Police, who's our blue, going to be our blue light link. So that's, that's also an important appointment to the council. Um, Brian and is Brian. Is this your last? You, you finish in March, so you, we've got still got some more meetings to go before your term of office ends. And, and right, but still, you, you're still with us till the end of uh, end of March. And, and uh, David, also, some of your term of office ends right, end, of end of March. Yes. So, again, plenty to do till the end of March. But thank you for what you both, what you both done for the council. Um, we also have Zach Foley, um, who's in the. Uh, Zach's going to join us at the next meeting, but he's observing today. So welcome, welcome, Zach, um, and uh, Ray Rogers from Upper West Surrey. Hi, Ray. So nice to see you. And uh, Ray's again observing the council, and will join officially at the next MEX meeting. And they'll be here this afternoon for the, the governor training. Oh, sorry, uh, behind us on screen is Tom Quinn. Uh, I think maybe having difficulty. <laughs> if someone could send a sign, if someone could send a text or something to Tom, please, to say, to say um, we're on the way. Um, the... the the, uh, the the COG meetings are available to the public to join in personal live via MS Teams once it once it's working correctly, um, and there is a part two today, but that's for governors only. Um, that's a, a training session. I think Michael Whitehouse, the senior independent director, is going to join that session um, to also to, to to assist with the uh, assist with the discussions. We've got apologies from um, Anne Osler, Simon Dobinson, Barbara Wallace. Barbara's here. Sorry, Barbara, you arrived. You you arrived uh, post hoc. P uh, Peter Lee's on annual leave, uh, and Lee Westwood has to uh, also have to apologise as well. Are there any other apologies we're aware of? No, dear. Okay, thank you. Um, any declarations of interest, pecuniary or otherwise, in the items we're discussing? No one's connected with the items of discussion. Thank you. Um, we've got the minutes of the previous meeting. Are you all happy that a true and accurate record? Yeah, I'm, I'm not. Um, I'm two reasons. The agenda... Can you turn your mic on, Dev? A report from MDC at each council meeting is part of the terms of reference. Um, for whatever reason, David as chair wasn't there. Uh, I, as deputy chair, I wasn't asked to make a report. If you remember, I did make a quick verbal report in the meeting, pointing out the, to the admission, but none of that appears actually in the minutes to the meeting. And I think what's important is that it's not what the minutes, it's what was said at the meeting or what's in the minutes, actually, that counts. And so I think that what I said was brief and basically is very much in line with what is in the current MDC report. But it, we either make a choice of being derelict in the requirements for that meeting by not reporting at least a minor uh, MDC report. Um, I have read the minutes and I can't anywhere find that. It ought to be on the recording, but if we also remember there were some problems with the microphone, and I remember Simon complimenting me on keeping going, despite the fact I had two microphones, so maybe 
It's just minute. It's missing from the records. Thank you. Okay. Well, Beck, can we make sure the records are amended, please? Uh, that would be very helpful. Um, any other? Can we just take the any other matters? From the, any other corrections? Of the minutes. You're happy otherwise that a true and accurate record. Thank you. Um, the action log and matters arising. So, hand over, sir. Thank you. So there's two actions. Turn, turn the microphone. Mm, sorry. So there's two actions. One around Nexus House refurb update, which has been um, confirmed to be completed by end of March. And then there was another action around the C1 license issue, uh, where the comments are we have removed the need to have a C1 at the time of application. So those who do not currently hold the qualification can still apply and obtain their license. It applies to all grades of staff. Um, where the trust pay for upfront, and then they can have a choice of a uh, payback option of six, twelve, or eighteen months. So that's an update which one from one of the executives has, has given that information from the HR department. HR department. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and what the, the, fir the first point was regarding the modifications Nexus to Nexus. So just to be clarification, this is the first floor. And is this is this the work that involves the um, removal of the walls and generally making the place more user friendly? Is that fair? Just, just for the record, all clear. Um, so, the good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all. Let me start with the um, human being stuff. Um, uh, so, the work will take place in two phases. It will start on the ground floor here because we need to relocate colleagues who take calls from the first floor to the ground floor, and then it will progress to the what you might term the proper HQ floor. Um, all to be completed by the end of March. That's the sequencing of works. Uh, we're not yet at the um, design phase, um, um, but as you might imagine, uh, colleagues from across the organisation are enthusiastically interested um, um, in what the prospects for the redesign look like. Um, I expect to be able to offer some visions of the future, so to speak. Um, in December, which is when the designs will be completed, and we should be able to talk about that then. Thank you. But that's obviously that's the executive matter. The the our last subo subo as chair of the as uh, people committee will keep a, an oversight in terms of working arrangements, etc., to make sure again we assure ourselves that we get back now into properly organised HQ with staff here on regular days in the week and properly organised back to work policies in a suitably open plan office. That's so again, we're clear on that. Yes. So, um, so um, the thing, the ancillary piece of work that runs alongside it, follows slightly along, is um, we need to update what flexible working means for the whole organisation. It's a hot topic of conversation no matter where you are, whether you're on the front line, whether you're in a corporate office. Um, and so the work that will run in parallel um, you'll see it actually firstly at the board meeting um, where we're talking about retention and the initiatives that we intend to take around retention. But it will also flow through into how we use the HQ and our expectations of people being present in the building for uh, similar parts of the week so we create a community there too. That, thanks, Simon. That's for the information of council. Obviously, we don't see you don't. It's not, it's not the role of this job of this council to seek assurance of that, but the non executives will seek assurance of that and we'll ensure that's 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 taken forward in, a, in an appropriate way. Um, Nick, just a quick uh, point going back to the last uh, point Richard raised about C1 licenses. So, just um, at, at the moment, there are people within the trust, the international paramedics, who don't have C1 licenses. They haven't achieved getting them yet, so they've been um, extra staff for months now. It's been going on. So they're not actually uh, autonomous in their practice, and, and these are registrants as well, so they can't work on cars, SRVs, and crew up with uh, lower qualified members of staff. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if they're within that, uh, what you just said about the C1s, is there a caveat as to the length of time before you obtain your C1? So is it three months, six months? Because actually we can employ these people, but they're not functional, fully functional. Right. I'll ask Subo to take that away and take that through the, to the People Committee. Thanks. I know London Ambulance Service have the same challenge. I think it's a sector issue, not, a, not an amazing CCAM issue, so let's be clear on that. It's an issue that's, that's affecting all UK ambulance, ambulance services, but particularly in the South East. So, uh, but we'll ask uh, Subo again to seek assurance on that through, through the People Committee. So thanks, thanks, Nick. 
Right, let's move on to the important item which is we're bringing to the council so early on in the meeting is, is the is the an update on the development of the trust strategy and David Luis Salaz is here to, to to initiate that discussion. You have been involved in a, a number of you in various discussions on this. Did I, sorry, Kirsty, did I miss your hand before? Sorry. Um, you have been involved in various discussions because as, as, the strategy is still in its formulation stage. So, David, would you like to give the, the council an update, please, of where we're up to? And then we'll take questions. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Brilliant. You, you can. And uh, I'm trying to share some slides that don't seem to be appearing on the screen. Can you share, if you're in the meeting, David, can you share through your laptop? Yes, I'm sharing from my laptop. Um, it should be working. It's working as a normal meeting. It's on the Zoom, by the way. So we'll give it a second. It's in the cloud somewhere. <laughs> it had to have nothing to do with my. Am I in that invite? Yeah. Jody's saying she can see the presentation. I think there was a reason why we did it this way. That's Something is happening. David, I'm not sure what your plans are this morning. Yeah, there's been a suggestion we take Simon's report now while we sort out the technology. Is that that's not going to hinder your morning? Okay. So can I suggest we can we take the chief executive report, which the is. Um, this has been in circulation with board papers, but it's on, there's a copy of it in the, on, the, on the table in front of you. So an update from the Chief Executive for information. Um, thank you. Um, I'll take the report as read, but I just wanted to draw out um, six points, if I may. Um, so... Okay. Okay. Let me just carry on anyway. Um, uh, nothing of I say is of that much interest. I'm sure they won't be missing it. Uh, they won't miss it that much. Anyway, um, six points from me, if I may. Um, um, I'd like um, to start just by um, reflecting on uh, kind of two visits that we've, well, a visit in particular that we had last week. Um, from Amanda Pritchard, who came to see the Medway Centre. It's great to be able to have the Chief Exec of the NHS come and see. And what, just to remind us all, is unique amongst ambulance facilities in the country. Um, we are the only ambulance service that has uh, such a combined facility. And I know not all of you are on X, formerly known as Twitter, but um, she tweeted about her visit earlier on this week and was, I know, immensely grateful to the staff who um, made time to host her um, and to uh, uh, take her out in the back of a truck. And she saw, you know, the real deal, sick patients, what we do, what we do well, and I know was extremely grateful to everybody. Um, so I just wanted to start with that. It's great to be able to showcase something that is as good as that. In the spirit of uh, showcasing too, um, uh, I wanted to draw attention to, because it happened since I wrote my report, what was an astonishingly successful volunteer conference, the first of its kind. Um, I tweeted about that, and for those who... Um, again, who don't follow on Twitter, the amazing thing for me was to be able to go up and stand in front of over 200 people, a sea of red, as I said in my tweet, and look out across the people who give of their time to us in so many ways and who've done so for so long. Um, the feedback on the conference, I think, was so significantly positive that it is the first annual conference, but it will not be the last. And I think 
um, the sense of commitment, purpose, dedication, contribution, ideas in the room was outstanding. It was an amazing day for us all who were there. And um, so it just gives me an opportunity in this forum really to say thank you to everybody who volunteers in whatever capacity for this organisation because the work that you do um, shone through um, like a beacon on that day. It was a, a day that I don't think any of us who were fortunate enough to be there um, would forget. Um, and, um, you know, it was it was amazing. Um, and really, um, one of the things for linking the um, conversation we're about to have with the strategy into this conversation is I said at that day, and we had a session on the strategy at that day, there needs to be a really vibrant future for volunteering in a number of different guises um, in the organisation as we go forward. And indeed, the role that volunteers will play, given the likely rising demand, um, the profile of what we're going to need to respond to, is going to become more and more important as time goes on. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we have this morning on the strategy and more particularly the role of volunteering within it as we develop as a service. Third thing to reflect on and celebrate was, uh, I hadn't been to it before, but the 2023 awards season was an undeniable success. Um, um, and um, I have to say I've been to many awards ceremonies in my time, uh, in my many years working in the NHS, and I said to the team, and I sincerely meant it and would want to say to you here, they are the best awards ceremonies I've ever been to. I just think they were outstanding. For me, I think them, and it was it was a, a, quite an astonishing experience again because um, you get to meet some of the people to whom we have made a difference, um, and no matter the issues that assail the NHS or indeed assail CCAM, um, we all should remember that when you get to meet them, as I do, and I was immensely privileged to be able to do so, um, being able to look them in the eye and you can see what it meant to people was a, an experience that will live long in my memory. Um, two matters now of more prosaic nature just to draw attention to. It won't have escaped everybody's notice that the national backdrop um, for the NHS is going to be challenging. Um, the money this year is tight. You know that NHS England was batting for an extra billion pounds to go into the winter and to cover the costs of strike action. It got about 200 million. So in essence, um, we face a task that is pretty Herculean as an NHS just to get through the rest of this year, let alone um, make inroads into some of the performance challenges that await us. We remain on track and are the ask of us as a partner in our system is to deliver our control total. We remain on track to do that. But again, linking to our strategy, um, we're going to have to face some challenging questions around the corner if we are to maintain that ability to keep on coming in on balance and to actually be um, viable as an organisation going forward. Um, so the discussions that we have in that strategy space are not only just about where we've got to, but they are starting to how do we right-size the organisation to be able to live within the financial constraints. Because no matter, and I'm not making a party political point here, but no matter the outcome of the next general election, I am confident that the financial backdrop will remain very challenging for the NHS. The strategy is our big opportunity to get ahead of that, and it's really important that we do so. In year, I expect us to retain and hit our control total. We continue, and we are becoming one of progressively fewer ambulance services to remain within our C2 mean. Um, uh, and the other ask of us this year is that we hit that 30-minute standard. So those are the two twin goals that, as an organisation, as our contribution to the wider system, we have been asked um, to deliver. And again, as we think about the strategy, the question has to come, how do we maintain that position going forwards? Because it will become ever harder, given the demand that we expect with our current operating model. 
Um, finally, um, to remind me again of the value of all that we do, it was a great privilege and to go out with the two Andrews um, last week and to see our CFRs in action. Um, uh, the service that they provided was to the patients we saw absolutely first rate. You would have felt really comforted, comfortable if they had been the first people that had turned up and see you and it would have been remiss of me not to acknowledge and thank Andrew for his kindness in hosting me on that day. Um, it reminded me of the wide variety of tasks that our CFRs do, including helping fix um, a gentleman's broadband um, um, as a, a little sideline during one of the calls we went to. Um, but um, the work that you do, Andrew, and you and your colleagues do, just looping back to that conference, is, is of real value, and it was important to me to be able to say thank you. Happy to take questions on any of the other items I've talked about um, in my report or indeed anything I've just said there. Thanks. Now just, just to add to your comments about the volunteers event, which was, which was absolutely first class, um, and also the awards ceremonies, I think just to acknowledge our Blue Light colleagues, what was also pleasing to me was to see awards made both to fire brigade, fire service colleagues and to police colleagues in the police where there have been great examples of joint working and support to our teams and um, I thought that also was a, was a really healthy sign so just just for the record if we can just make sure that is acknowledged you know we are we are a partnership and, and uh, that was certainly shown in some of those awards as well. Um, in terms of uh, questions of what, what the Chief Executive report just in terms of questions for clarity obviously the board seek assurance of the Chief Executive through the board meetings and, and I know Howard will address the financial planning as part of his report um, on the Finance Committee. So any questions or comment, questions of clarity for D D David, first of all? Uh, well, I'll probably address this one to you, David. Um, in the uh, Chief Executive Report, he's outlined seven priorities or key objectives, as you might call it. Is there any um, assurance that can be given to the council government that uh, uh, we, we can make these uh, priorities, objectives over the next two or three years? Well, just to be, to be clear, the, the, Simon and I obviously reports reports to me and then to the board. We do have performance discussions. There is a clear set of objectives which are monitored via the uh, Appointment and Remuneration Committee, and we have regular conversations regarding progress towards that. Um, you say confidence. Well, they are stretch targets. Um, and I know the Chief Act is going to be stretched, but I also know right. he's got every there's every commitment there in yeah. terms of both the hours he's working, but the what he's doing. I can give you that assurance. I'm more comfortable now than I have been in the last five and a half years. So I mean that's we we've got more to do. There's a lot to do, uh, and it's the job of the board. The board will get behind the Chief Executive. He has our absolute support. We'll get behind him, and obviously I will monitor the, the individually performance of the objectives. But the, the, the board itself will obviously uh, will 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 watch that carefully through its subcommittees as well. hope that gives you yeah, the assurance you need. You. Yeah. Okay. Other questions of clarity? Yeah. Could, could we, thank, could we take... Uh, your, your, okay. your um, Simon, um, it was at the council meeting this time last year that questions were raised in terms of the quality of IT after a major outage. Your report of the 5th of October refers to an extension of the investigation that's taking place. At an earlier council meeting when I've raised the issue, the matter was in hand. There's a brief reference to it in terms of the Finance and Investment Committee. Could you, in terms of clarity, could you actually, uh, we're now, your report was the 5th of October, we're now coming up to the end of November and approach in December, could you clarify when we might expect a coherent and understandable report so we know what's going on in IT? Just in his approach to this, should we address the chairman of the Audit Committee? Michael, if you could comment on this, because um, I know you, 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 this is something which the Audit Committee is uh, monitoring carefully.
our, yeah. our view is we are assured, but we do need to change, firstly, the leadership of that function, and everything else then should flow in terms of capability, yeah. longer term strategy, uh, all of those things that I think need to be in place. Um, it's, it's a comprehensive report. It's one of the better ones I've seen in my in my professional career. But uh, Paul, perhaps you'd like but, to... Paul, before you comment, just, we were talking about leadership. That's leadership in the generic sense. That's in a public meeting. We're not talking about individual members of staff here. We're talking leadership in the general in the general sense. So let's be clear on that. But Paul, in terms of you as our leader on IT, for as, as most of our executives, yeah. could you just give a note, clarify what's been said? The right. It's a very comprehensive report, so it's quite a lot of pages. And, it, and the, the scope of it was very broad, and it was done by the, the chap who used to head up the London Ambulance Service, who's steeped in ambulance uh, IT, and he actually worked here a few years ago. So we're very pleased with the report. The findings are really good, and they're actually been actioned already. So we're, the, it highlights, like Michael said, that we don't, could prioritise things a little bit better, and we could have like a programme office that tracks progress of things. Uh, and both of those have been action, you know, are being worked on now, which is a big step forward. Um, and uh, the, the, there was some good news in the report as well, which is we have some very talented individuals that managed to do things like Medway and roll out 3,000 iPads, etc. So there are some good things and some bad things. But the main thing is uh, that we've got uh, a good technology base now. We're not uh, buying products that, that possibly aren't as suited as they could be which was the cause of some of the incidents that we had in the last few years, uh, they had been replaced. So you, I think you'll enjoy the report, Brad, and I enjoy... Uh, I I, can can I clarify, the board, the board have not received the report yet. We've only just received it, so we don't yeah. get ahead of ourselves. And it's coming here. to a public The board. purpose of this meeting is to seek assurance and our executives are understanding of the issue. I think by the answers we've heard, they are. Um, the executive are charged with making sure that report is implemented, but it literally has only been received in the last few weeks. So we're slightly ahead of schedule, but at least the, the council is well notified now about what's happening, and it will come back to the next council meeting with a full update from the my non-executive colleagues at the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Brian. Martin, sorry. No, the finance committee look at performance, Martin. The finance committee look at performance, and 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 and, and, the, and the chair of the finance committee was going to mention that in his in his report. We do keep an overview of performance. So I think we can clar the chief executive can clarify certain information for sure. Yeah. Um, and um, it's really a question of in terms of the they were improving, as I understood from what I read, from what I've read. Is that, as we go into winter, still the case? Um, sorry. Yes. So if we look at um, our ability to hit the C2 mean across the English ambulance services, we're not counting here the devolved administrations. I think we're one of three or four now left who can still hit the C2 mean in this year. That in itself is not an insignificant achievement to be going into winter with. Um, in terms of hospital handovers, we are fortunate in this region to have some of the best hospital handover times in the country. And that's a great tribute to the work that our teams have done out in the individual stations to maintain those relationships. And it's no small matter, as you will know, to continue to achieve that. Call answering has been our area of systemic weakness. Um, We've taken some interim steps um, in the run-up to winter to use the virtual capacity because the technology is now sufficiently advanced that other systems can pick up who've got slack capacity, some of the call answering, if we are in trouble. Um, so our call answering has stabilised, still not where I would like us to be, and there's a longer-term strategic piece about how do we position this particular related to this building, a coral answering capability in an area of extremely high employment um, with a very major employer, sorry, that direction over there, um, uh, sitting on our doorstep. So if I was looking at us across the other ambulance services in England, 
I would say as we go into winter, we're in a relatively strong position. Now that's not to say that we will not have challenges over winter. We've got one tier one, one hospital system that is particularly challenged in our patch, so we're going to need to continue to pay attention to that. Um, and we've got all the normal travails of winter. But compared to many of my colleagues, I'm relatively pleased with where we are at the moment. The, the board will also would endorse that, and the, the matters you raise are very much under the eye line of my non-executive colleagues and through the appropriate committees as well, because call entering has been an issue of some concern for some time. There has been a comprehensive action plan, which we've taken a report on at the last board meeting, um, and similarly with winter, there's a, there's again, we've taken a, we're bringing back the winter plan to the next me next meeting, again, to seek, make sure we are as, as planned as we can be for what's likely to be a challenging few months. Okay. Any other matters of clarity for the two objective? Good, thank you. Yep, Nick? Just a quick point about call taking, um, call answering, sorry. Um, I know there's this sort of reciprocal agreement across the, the UK, um, and I know that we've been relying quite heavily on the Northwest, I believe, for if any West of Midlands. Our, West Midlands, sorry, if any of our calls go over. Uh, I can't remember what the period is, they, they pick them up. So I'm just wondering if this is done because everybody loves each other or is there a financial implication for the trust? So if we we have to divert X hundreds of calls, how much is that costing us per call? And then in relation to employing someone to do the job? Um, so it's a good question. Well, I'll need to give you some detail outside of here to get the precise breakdown. So broadly speaking, um, services in the east and southeast of the country struggle to recruit sufficient core handlers. In the north and in the west of the country, it is less difficult to recruit them. So that's the employment market situation. That's not going to be new, and it's because we pay our core handlers um, at a band three rate. Um, and that clearly has differential impacts in terms of what people look to do. I would also say... In, say again here, I pay tribute to our call handlers who do one of the most difficult jobs, as I know you know, Nick, in the entire organisation. And we need to think about that role going forward. Um, NHS England um, have supported us in some of the initial phases of our call answering, though it is a fee-for-service arrangement. We do pay for this. Um, and it kicks in, I think, after 1 minute 30 seconds if we are unable to take a call. Um, now, clearly, we need to do more to try and either grow our own capacity, or if that's not possible, as it is for some other ambulance services that also struggle with this, look to a different solution over time. And again, although I'm linking a lot of things to the strategy, we can't be mindful of the fact that we've got to be mindful of the fact that these sort of questions should detain us about are we going to go for a model uh, in future where more of this type of facility is done commonly because the resilience of the country is much greater than the resilience of an individual region or indeed an individual service or can we get to a place where we can stand on our own two feet and do this. Jury's out on that question and but outside of here happy to come back on the cost of it, we have, have had some support, as I say, from NHS England in the first part of this. The Finance Committee and the People Committee, though, are both involved in those issues around recruitment retention and the, the financial modelling. So um, that's something which we picked up as part of normal, normal business. But the clue there, as Simon said, is, is with the strategy. So can I suggest we move on to uh, the strategic presentation? Hopefully technology yes. is concluded yes. uh, and hopefully we're being received by my colleague, Mr Quinn, in, uh, in Surrey. Test, test. I think I think we've got takeoff. Um, thanks, everybody, and thanks for having me here today. Um, what you're going to see today is the first time that we are presenting the findings of our diagnostic phase, and I'm going to talk a little bit about process. But I want to take us back through where we started this journey, which was in a session in May where this group sat together and set out the frame of how were we going to go about developing a strategy. What was important? It was a joint session with the board and the Council of Governors. And there's seven things that came out of that session. I'm just gonna recount them so we can all go back to those seven points and ask ourselves the question, are we following 
that framing that we set out. We talked about developing a trust-wide strategy that was going to be clinically led. We talked about it being developed by and for our people. We talked about the inclusive engagement. We talked about making sure that it set us up, as someone has already referred to, in a financially sustainable envelope, something that we can take into the future with confidence that will be deliverable. We talked about being innovative. We talked about working in partnership and involving our partners through this process. And whatever it is that we do, make sure that is a strategy that is executable and that is something that we can deliver over the course of the next three to five years, which is the horizon that we're looking at. So I'm going to come back to these points um, through the presentation and we'll reflect at the end as to where we think we are against these different names and there's clearly areas that we will have to focus on as we move through the different phases of the strategy. But just as a reminder, uh, this is the, the envelope and I know colleagues around the table have already seen this, but we're now at the end of that diagnosing and forecasting phase. We've done quite a lot of work with our people, our partners and our patients to understand both the baseline of the current challenges as well as a peek into the future, looking across different dimensions of financial quality, population health needs, of what's going to happen in the future to consolidate that into the narrative that you will see today. We are now tipping into that phase two and we have a couple of big design sessions going on next week with colleagues, uh, which are not going to be the only design sessions. We're going to be running design sessions throughout December and early January before we conclude phase two at the back end of January. As you remember, that was the original timetable. And then we will go into that phase three setting. So the, the board will uh, receive this in public in terms of our conclusion and recommendation of where does the executive think we need to be going as a direction of travel on the board on the 8th of February. And we will spend the rest of quarter four developing that execution plan, that five-year transformation plan that we will have to follow, which will then be part of and embedded into our board assurance framework going forward. In terms of what you're seeing here today is the level one. So you don't have to worry about going into detail of this, but needless to say, what you'll see today is a high level account of the conclusions we've reached at the end of phase one. There's tons and tons of detail that underpin this, which I'm happy to pick up separately um, because today is about trying to understand and capturing the tone of what we've heard. I'm going to try and do the, the best job I can at playing back to you what we've heard from our people, what we've heard from our partners, what we've heard from our patients, and what our analysis says the future holds if we do nothing. That's what this case for change is trying to accomplish. And whenever I start this presentation, I like to reflect on the fact that, that we are CKM and there is much that we should be proud of. And I've, I've, I wanted to capture that at the very beginning of the conversation. Over two million calls picked up every single year, three quarters of a million patient contacts and lives that we're able to influence and change every single year. And we drive enough miles to go to the moon and back every single year 50 times. Not an insignificant amount of things that we do at CCAM is the way that I would summarize this slide. Therefore, there is a lot that we have to be proud about. And as we approach this strategy, our aim has been relentlessly to co-design this strategy in a way that whatever we end up as a product meets the evolving needs of our communities. And that is a very important point of the strategies because the needs of our population are changing. They are changing and I think we've lost the slides now. just as I was getting into a flow. And the slides look so good as well. It's just very difficult to do this without the slides. As you, you can see I was building up to something here. Um, I, I, will, I will keep going um, and hopefully we recover the slides. But the populations, uh, the populations that we serve are changing. And we've looked at uh, several factors. The first one is growth. Um, so our analysis suggests that we will serve about 125,000 people more in the southeast over the next five years. That's about a 2.5% increase, uh, which is about, there we go, which is about in line with the uh, uh, long-term projections from the Office for National Statistics. Now, the thing that we will see disproportionately affect us over the next five years, in particular in our region, and you will remember we've talked about our demographics in the past, is a disproportionate increase of people living over the age of 65 about 130,000, which represents a 12.5% increase. And we know from some of the clinical work that we've shared with you before, one in two patients that we attend to today are already living above the age of 65 with increased presentation of um, falls, frailty, and additional complexity that goes alongside with that. 
which is the third trend that we have picked up on. You will remember us talking about 50% of our patients today living with five or more comorbidities, 67% of our patients living with two or more ill health conditions, and that trend will just continue to increase. And the thing that we picked up through the strategy analysis in a bit more detail is how those needs may be different across where we operate. So the thing that has become apparent in the public health needs analysis is that those needs of ill health or the, or the needs of the population, say in North Kent, are very different to those in Surrey. And that is reflected through the analysis of our ICSS strategies and it's going to have implications for how we think about the organization in the future. The probation is going to play a factor as well. We know we live in an area of very high uh, uh, areas with very high affluence and areas of um, kind of bottom 10 percentile deprivation. Just to put a stat out there uh, from our public health needs analysis, the life expectancy for females difference between where you live in our patch is about 15 years. So clearly we have huge population health inequalities um, and at the moment we are not potentially responding to those. We're going to come to our model in a second. Our projection is if the if this uh, continues and we do nothing to respond to this, we can expect to see an increase of about 111,000 calls a year, the equivalent of about a 15% increase. Now, the thing to note is that that demand will not increase uh, so much in the critical and emergency care bracket. The majority of the growth will come from the urgent primary care social care bracket of activity as a result of this uh, projection and analysis that we've looked at. So. Um, that is something that we've picked up on, and it's not something, uh, one of the things we've done through this presentation is pepper it with the things that we've heard from our people um, throughout the engagement. Um, our patients tell us this, so I'm going to read out some of these quotes every year. I see more people like me with complex health needs, and uh, from one of our newly qualified paramedics, we're seeing more calls for older patients with multiple conditions. It is vital that we adapt. So we're seeing this both from the analysis, but also from our engagement, which I'm going to touch on some figures at the end. Um, the one takeaway from this slide is that we will expect to see this 15% growth, the majority of that growth being uh, more complex rather than in that critical and emergency care bucket. And this is happening to us as the NHS is facing significant challenges and we don't operate in a bubble as CCAM. As colleagues know, there are system pressures and someone has alluded to some of them, uh, both operationally, both uh, nationally, regionally and locally. We see this in a number of uh, our partners and ourselves and part of the driver for that has been a disconnect between funding and demand over the last 10 years or so. Now the response from the NHS perspective is to set up the integrated care boards which you're all familiar with and the integrated care boards and systems are there to help providers work together integrate care to deliver more effective and efficient care for the communities that it serves and in our case we've got four integrated care boards Kent, Surrey, Sussex and Frimley. Now the challenge that we faced as we've looked at both inside and outside through our engagement with partners is that we have a real challenge with integration and we've reached that conclusion that is that we are not sufficiently joined up with our partners to deliver integrated care and that happens for a number of reasons but I'll give two examples to bring to light. One is, for instance, our boundaries, uh, our operating boundaries are both split into east and west, which cut across a number of geographies. That poses a challenge in terms of leadership capacity to uh, meaningfully engage and for people and clinicians closer to patients to be empowered to develop solutions closer with the systems that are working through these issues. And as uh, systems are developing provider collaboratives, which is are the forums where they're going to bring providers together, we are going to continue to struggle to integrate unless we change. And the other one is in the impact that we've had in their thinking about how systems are going to resolve some of these challenges. And looking through four integrated care systems as strategies uh, that describe how health and care and social care will integrate and deliver better outcomes for patients over the next five years in the southeast. Across four of these documents for Kent, Surrey, Sussex and Frimley were mentioned twice, which is a reflection of some of the work that we have to do as a result of this strategy and some of the work that we are doing as we develop the strategy to change the proposition of what our role is because fundamentally at the moment our role is not well defined and we need to be able to come up with some of the answers and propositions with our system partners about what is the role of the ambulance service going to be into the future to help systems address this challenge so this is not so much about what systems can do for us it's about what we can do for the systems and being clear that we are developing a strategy that puts us as a system player uh, understanding that different systems will have different priorities 
and clearly we have a work to do as a multi-system provider. Um, in terms of some of the engagement, here's some quotes of things that we have heard. So don't hear it from me, let's hear it from some of our integrated care board leaders. This is a quote that somebody said to us, the ambulance service feels like a silent partner within the system. Uh, our patients are telling us this, the ambulance service needs to work with other providers to ensure the right care at the right time. And this is from a staff network chair, an operational team leader said to us a couple of weeks ago, if our relationships with other providers were more mature, we could do so much better for our patients in the community. So it triangulates quite well with what we are hearing, both through the engagement, but also through the analysis and the structured interviews with our system partners. The projection here in the inference is that if we do nothing, this inadequate care coordination will result in further unmet patient needs and poor quality of care. And clearly, as we enter the design phase, uh, the conclusion that we reach is that we have a responsibility to be very clear and reshape what our role is in the system to be able to help and support the wider health and social care systems. Because our model, and this is the third point of what we found out through the diagnostics phase, is that our model has not evolved enough. If we unpack this a little bit, we already know that there's increasing patient needs uh, with further unmet uh, needs, both from a social urgent care and some primary care work that we're seeing. Only 13% of our patients today are in need of what you'd call life-saving or life-changing critical and emergency care support. And despite this, despite the fact that only a fraction of our patients have a need for a uh, life-saving resource, that is the resource that we dispatch most of the time. The majority of our patients receive an undifferentiated response, uh, despite them having vastly different needs. As part of this work, we've worked with our uh, clinical advisory group who have broken down the different patient categories into 12 clinical profiles that we are going to be using to develop the new models of care in the design phase. Um, but it's quite an interesting way to look at it uh, where we are seeing that where we have most of our capabilities as an organization and responding with double crewed ambulances, with stretchers and with all the equipment that we respond today, that only serves a small proportion of our patients. For the vast majority of our patients that we're seeing come to us with minor illness, and of life care needs, mental health, and falls and frailty, um, we are matching against our skills pretty poorly, which means we do not have the right skill sets to attend to some of these patients. And that's our fourth conclusion. Uh, our staff do not have the skill sets that they need to meet those increasingly uh, higher complex needs that they're finding themselves with in front of patients. Um, and here's a couple of examples of things that we've heard um, and both fixing the Wi-Fi as an example that we've heard today, or in this case, in the words of one of our emergency care support workers, we have to make sure our patients have the heating on and that there's food in the fridge, uh, all the way through to one of our experienced paramedics said this to us again a couple of weeks ago, we don't feel we have the right training to serve the or to give care to patients um, that are presenting to us with this increased complexity. So our people are telling us this, and there's a couple of conclusions that we can draw from this. The first one is that if we do nothing over the next five years, our model of care, the way in which we do things today, will fail to meet this increasing complexity of needs from patients. It's already struggling today, and we're going to look at some stats in a second, um, but it will continue to do so. And the inference here is actually we've made the connection in reverse. We usually talk about how we need to look after our people and our people will look after our patients. And that is absolutely true. The conclusion that we've been able to reach through this process is that because we are operating within a model of care that is slightly, in Simon's words, bends out of shape, the fact that we're not putting our people in a position where they can deliver the best care they can is having a real impact on the well-being of our people. Uh, and clearly, this becomes a vicious cycle from here. So the conclusion here is that um, not only we are going to be failing the needs of our patients, we are going to be uh, not supporting our people in the right way going forward. And that's how the, the changes into the model of care need to be looked at as we go into the design phase. And if we break down this impact just in a couple of uh, stats today and then look at what will happen in the future, our service today, we take 33% longer with each patient that we did in 2018. So from a productivity point of view, we have seen a real impact from this mismatch between patient need, skill set, and um, operating model. Because this is a byproduct of us not dispatching our resources to the right patient with the right skill sets and other factors across the NHS 
impacting our ability to get patients the right care at the right time at the first try. And this is having a direct impact on our patients. Uh, if we look at stroke as an example, we're taking 42% longer than we did in 2018 to get stroke patients to hospital. And clearly this has a devastating impact on harm that patients see. And this has a direct impact on our people's satisfactions. We know we have amongst the lower satisfaction across the NHS as a sector. Uh, and here's a couple of quotes that support this from an advanced paramedic practitioner. We find it frustrating when we can't do the right thing for a patient. From some of our community first responders a couple of weeks ago at the volunteer conference, uh, yielding us results, we're trying to be all things to all people which we cannot sustain. And when we model this forward, we reach one of two conclusions. The first one is that if we are to live within our means, which we expect, as Simon has explained, to be continuing to be challenging, we could see our response times about double over the next five years, once you put together that increased complexity and demand need, and the fact that our model today is not quite serving patients because of the productivity issues that we've seen. That's our do-nothing scenario. Um, the flip side of that is that we would need in the region of 600 additional colleagues on the road alone, let alone in support services, to be able to meet that additional demand, to be able to respond to our most critical patients in a timely manner. So whatever place you choose, whether we need to operate in the current way today and try to hit our performance targets, that's not a sustainable and affordable answer. That is not what we are suggesting needs to happen, but that is a reflection of how far away we are in our current model from meeting the future needs of our patient. So just to summarize, we believe we're running out of road. Someone has already alluded to this. And the key things that we're going to be thinking about as we go into design is, A, how do we deal with that increased complexity and population demand that we will see over the next five years? How do we integrate better with partners, acknowledging that the whole NHS is facing significant partners, and the only way we can resolve this is by working in better partnership with ICBs and redefining, reshaping what our role is as part of a wider health and social care system. We need to change our model, not only because it's no longer meeting the full needs of our patients, it's no longer going to be meeting the needs and expectations and the well-being of our people. And that is something that we need to get right. And finally, even if, um, which we're not suggesting we need to do, but even if we were happy with, we're just going to continue with the existing model and we picked up any of those three above and we were happy to live with those implications, we would need an additional 600 people on the road to be able to do that in our current model, which we know would not be the right thing, we know would not be sustainable and would not be affordable. So it's simply not a realistic answer for us at this point in time. So we need to shift away. Somebody said to me last week, we need to shift away from working harder. We need to start working smarter. And that is the ethos we're taking into phase two. So at this point, doing nothing is not an option and we must radically change our approach. And um, obviously, just talking about engagement, I just wanted to share with you, because I know that the Council of Governors was very interested in this. Um, since we started this process, we estimate, and I'll explain why we estimate, we, we've spoken to in the region of 300 to 400 uh, colleagues that have fed into this process. The reason there's an estimate is because we've devolved quite a lot of our engagement where we have local leads on stations and in the EOCs who are leading on this engagement every couple of weeks are running their own engagement sessions. So. There's a, there's a range there because sometimes we get the data, sometimes we don't get the data, but it's great that local teams are leading on these discussions locally uh, because, as I always say to everybody, I can't do this by myself. This is not my strategy, this is all of our strategy. So we're doing quite a lot by way of empowering our local leaders to have this narrative. They all have this presentation and have this as a discussion point with their teams. And now the conversation is shifting to what are your ideas for the future? Um, we sent 62 letters to different ICB uh, leaders partner organizations, uh, Blue Lights, uh, education on uh, getting them involved in the strategy to get uh, registrations of interest. And we've had quite good follow-up with that. We've spoken to about 30 ICB leaders through either workshops or structured interviews, and that's fed into some of the conclusions we've reached in terms of our position as an organization in the health and care system and the realization that we need to do better. And we've had just over 300 responses on our initial patient surveys that we've set up through phase one. Um, those will continue. We're working with Health Watch through December and January to do specific focus groups. Um, and we are one of the things that we're a little bit concerned as we're uh, about five percentage points away from 
being able to have a truly representative uh, cut through in terms of underrepresented groups in that engagement. So that's our focus, just so you're aware. We are tracking it, and it's an area that we're focused on in phase two, so we can make sure that the voices that we hear are true representation of the populations that we serve. And as we go into phase two, this is a real patient quote that I always like to finish this presentation on. To truly make a difference, it's time to be bold and to consider how to do things differently from how they have been done in the past. Innovation isn't just helpful, it is essential for the future. And that is very much the sentiment we're carrying into phase two. So happy to take questions, Chair, and I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you, David. Very comprehensive and very inclusive as well. I mean, just to, obviously, it's the board's job to set the strategy for the organisation after, after of, of appropriate consultation with with all the interested parties. And I think to summarise the board position, I think you say enough is enough, and I think that's coming through with the with the presentation. I think we have to draw a line in the sand here as an ambulance trust um, and say and really and force the conversations. And I think that's what the, I have to say. The work that we're doing, I commend the executive the way they've gone about seeking input from staff and the wider health and social care community. Um, and that really, really reflects the board's wish. We, we can't carry on as we are, period. We do need to change. But we're in a process. Um, so the board sets the strategy. Any questions or clarification from David in terms of the work we've done? And also anything we can help governors with in your dealing with your constituencies? recognise you've got a range of constituencies to work with, both elected, but also our statutory partners, Blue Life Partners, any any insight you can give us into help, helping us have those meaningful conversations. And David, in terms of presenting the final draft to the board, which we're talking in the in, in, early in the new year. Yeah, so just to remind colleagues of the time frame, thank you for the prompt. Um, the board will be obviously getting together and receiving a recommendation from the executive team on the third week of January and the recommendation will go to the public board on the 8th of February. Uh, that's going to be effectively the decision of the direction of travel because now we're obviously going through that process of long listing strategic options and going through a process of design going from big to small and then a recommendation through a rigorous evaluation process and then uh, a full publication by the end of March is what we're looking at which will be both the direction of travel plus the how are we going to get there piece of the story which is the important transformation plan. Strategies take years to implement and they also have a, trans a transitional period as well so we need to be yeah. realistic as well. Martin, you think you also, I think I saw your hand raised first and then David. David, can you turn your microphone on is it or get near the microphone? in your seat David or at least I was sitting in Matt's seat and we were saying very similar things obviously exactly what that looked like in terms of demographic change was different but essentially the issues are exactly the same and the, my one observation would be it's better to under promise and over deliver than over promise and under deliver because the reality is that strategy is as much merchant as it is planned um, and I think it's just a question of keeping a sense of realism about that. Um, I have the scars to prove it. Um, and one of the principal problems, of course, is that people are very fond of saying to the ambulance service, well, you need to work better with their, their wider health and social care network, right? They were saying that 20 years ago, and I'm sure Simon can remember it going back way before that, and, and David too. The reality is the rest of the system doesn't necessarily let's say move at quite the same speed and in quite the same way and effectively you're aiming at a continually moving goal so that's just an observation the second thing is a practical question about the milestones of change such that as i understand it from what i read in the bath that um the plan is now to have the final to have the sign off for the roadmap in february and the final version the final thing at the end of march now, unless things have changed dramatically, the plan for next year has to be into the wider NHS at the end of January. So there's a disconnect between when the strategy is ready and when the plan for year one has to be ready. So the question is, how do you juggle those two balls? Oh, there we are. Um, so we already have the planning assumptions for next year. Um, so we know what the financial settlement is going to be. 
Um, and so when I was talking earlier on, Martin, about right-sizing the organisation, we can plan now for what we're going to need to do in terms of the cost envelope that we have to operate in. Um, and broadly speaking, that is flat cash with a 4% SIP on top, approximately. Now, that doesn't take account of some of the ins and outs and some of the additional funding we may get, but broadly, that's the financial settlement we have for next year. The other point that you make is quite correct. Um, and we're spending a lot of time. In fact, I'm off to um, Sussex tomorrow to meet the Sussex ICB board, precisely to make sure that we proceed in lockstep. Um, because the critical question that we've got, we can dream whatever dreams we may like and, and plan for whatever plan we may like. If the rest of the system is either not capable or not willing or has no funding to deliver those aspirations, we would be planning on you know, the original castles in the sand. So um, our ICB colleagues are absolutely locked into this process. And we both have to be able to look each other in the eye and say at the end of the day, have we come up with something that's realistic? Um, and that will be a key test of this process. And we're doing it in three stages. So at each stage as we end, we're signing it off both internally, but also with them. So the question I will be asking Sussex Board tomorrow is, do you recognise this as our reality? Because that then allows us, if they recognise this as our reality, to go on to the next stages, well, what are we going to do about that then? Because the reality for us is we cannot carry on offering you, for the amount that you pay us, the ambulance service that you've had over the last number of years. Do you recognise that as our reality? The reality for them is if they're going to pick up some of the demand that they may need to, can they do that and how will they do that? And that's the, that's the challenge that we are now, and we will do that across Kent, Surrey, Sussex and Frimley before we move out of phase one. Phase two, I suppose, is where the interesting and exciting part comes, which is if we all accept the current reality, what do the potential futures look like? What choices do we have? And just again to reassure colleagues around this table, we will continue, you will note today there isn't a future described here, what we're describing in this stage is what is the challenge. The next stage will be how do we respond to it. And that will be the thing that comes back to us in January. And then the third phase, which we will move to by the end of March, is if we can all accept the future model, what then is the implementation plan? Who is going to do what? Because we will need them to do things. They will need us to do things. And it will be important that we are all absolutely clear on those points. But in terms of the right-sizing challenge, the money point, we already have more than enough information to start to answer that question. And those numbers are quite eye-watering uh, in their prospect and will need some fairly radical thinking to address. But obviously, <coughs> obviously the key input from the, the Council of Governors here to, to ourselves as non-executives is, is as you've got your nearest the communities you represent constituencies, um, it's important we get your we get your feedback in terms of how this strategy is, is, is developing. And so, uh, comments about the, from obviously our Blue Light community as well. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, really interesting and obviously blue light and particularly looking at from a fire point of view, all the, we recognise all the population growth and the, uh, the disparity in wealth and, and deprivation and so on across uh, the CCAM patch. Um, just interested where we are on climate change in this planning. Not so much, you know, should our fire ambulances be greener, but I think we can take that as red, but more the impacts on, um, on health and society of climate change and on service delivery of severe weather events. That's something big in our planning in the Fire and Rescue Service. And we are looking at the impacts on health in urban areas of sustained heat when you look at complex health conditions. So as we sort of operationalise, what's the relationship there? Is there thing, are there things we can share going forward? Thank you. How good one has championed this issue amongst the non-executive and I'm certainly raised a number of issues with executives who I know are actioning this. So, Howard, do you want to comment first? I'll bring in David. Uh, thank you. 
Um, yes, no, it's a good, really good point, good question. We do have a, uh, a green um, plan, a sustainability plan, but um, uh, I think the point you raise about the, Im the impact on customers in terms of health is something that we're not specifically picked up. So I think we ought to, uh, we should pick that up as, a, a, as an issue within that. Uh, and also, obviously, from the strategy, but our sustainability plan addresses all the things you'd expect in terms of, you know, um, vehicles and so on and so forth. But its impact on patients is not something we've picked up. So thank I, you. I, th I think it's a great question and a great challenge. Uh, I really do. The um, the clear. So we have a so on the green plan and the green strategy that we approved and the board approved earlier this year. That's going to be an integral part of this strategy. But clearly, because we've done a lot of the work. We're not spending a lot of time describing it. It's going to be an essential part of you know, meeting our environmental sustainability targets and commitments going forward. Um, I think from a response point of view, this is going to be something that we will need to ask ourselves, what is the forecast? Obviously, when we look at the next five years, which is the horizon of this, there is limited impact that we're going to see in some of the coastal areas in terms of immediate impact, because the impacts usually are in the much more longer range. Now. I remember somebody saying to me when I was designing an airport 10 years ago, uh, we were designing a drainage system and they said, we're playing for a one in a hundred years event and surely enough the next April the entire airfield flooded. To which I said, well, we don't need to worry about this for the next 99 years. <laughs> so the reality is I think um, some of this we, we just don't know is the answer. And I think um, we probably need to take that thinking away and come back with a more robust answer of what does it mean for our resiliency, which is largely where that answer would come through and how would we work with partnership organizations in particular, fire and police, to be able to respond to major natural events, flooding, etc. Because that's the likely thing that we will see more and more of in the southeast of England. Uh, that's a great comment, particularly in terms of recent flooding, etc. So I think in terms of our resilience for the future. David. So I've got two views on, on how we can build resiliency. One, having a very strong vision for what the final goals and outcomes look like <coughs> is important. It's going to be a role of the board and a role of leadership to hold a ring around that and have a very strong narrative because the, the moment we lose that, we, we lose our true north. So I think having a very strong narrative in true north that the leadership community can be aspiring to is really, really important to be able to have resiliency. Because then the plan will change. Of course, it will change. We need to have a good stab at what do we think the trajectory looks like. Um, one of the things that we have been looking at, and maybe someone wants to come in with this, is what is the team that will help us deliver this? What is either the transformation and project management office that will help us look at things and reevaluate, manage resources? Because that is where I think we have a weakness at the moment as an organization. But if we have a very clear set of goals and outcomes we want to achieve, and a strong transformation or project management office that helps us understand both the interdependencies and how projects may need to be reprioritized, that's what's going to give us resiliency. Um, and I expect the board will have its job at, through the board assurance framework, having constant oversight of what are those long-term outcomes, what do they mean for this year, and how is the executive and the trust progressing against delivery of them. Those would be sort of the three layers of you know, defense that I would be looking at. Never mind, particularly in terms of strategic risk, that's certainly something which we do need to continue, continue to review and in the light of experience. I'm going to bring in Tom Quinn uh, and then, uh, then Vanessa, but Tom, Tom wants to come in with a point from, from home.
Th thank you, Tom. That certainly is the over the overall board view. The point I made at the start of this discussion was that we have been the solution to many of the ills of the health and social care system. Um, we have some unique skills, but nevertheless, we haven't got the skills to do everything. And I think that that's something which we're, we're as a board we are now very much trying to trying to make that point, take that point forward, and champion that 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 uh, argument. Vanessa. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to go back because uh, I find the strategy really, really important and the discussions around the ICB integration is paramount. Um, so when you are having meetings with the ICB, I would really stress that the social care bit element is, is absolutely paramount as well because without the social care, it doesn't matter how much health requirements and, and put is in place. If they go home with no social care in place, then you're going to end up back in hospital. So when you do meet with the ICB, um, which I work very, very closely with in Kent, then I really want to stress that social care has to be element, that has to be part of that meeting. So social services, but also the third sector. The third sector represents so many volume of people that are living at home. And what I find difficult working is with the streams, it is not integrated. The, the word is in the ICB, but there is not the integration. And I don't think if for, you know, the volume of calls that I see the paramedics, I call, I call the ambulance once a week for my clients. I support over 350 people. And I'm telling you now in Kent, in Thanet, my client group's going to 40 plus, not 55 plus. That could all be resolved if there was a better integration and a better support systems in place. So I just really want to stress that when we are talking about integration, it isn't just with, with health colleagues, it is about the social care element, which is really, really vital to keep people safe at home. And also for the paramedics to be able to actually refer I think if there was a referral process that was much easier then that would actually sort of combat paramedics going out and staying with patients far longer than they should be yeah it's a great point Vanessa and I was at the camp board and that conversation was absolutely had there is a key as we get into the next stage one of the things we're going to have to think about is who is caring for those patients so that they don't need to be conveyed to hospital? And I think there's a really important role for the ambulance service of the future to probably start looking at, rather than just reactive care, waiting till a crisis has happened, moving much more into the preventative space. Now, that's the reason why we now need to think of radical. That's the reason radical. Traditionally, we in the ambulance service have waited until a problem's occurred and then we've responded, and we respond really well. I don't think that's going to be where we're going to be in the future. Now, the board view is we want to be on the front foot. Nick, then Martin, then we move on to the next item. Uh, yeah, thank you, David, for presenting my views more eloquently than I could possibly do, so, um, in regard to the state of things. Um, two, two things, really. One, totally agree with what's been said about the social care aspect. And I think ambulance people in general are proactive. They just don't have a support network. Um, Ashford Project, different thing. We could talk about that all day. They do have a supportive network, and it's been really effective. So that's working really well in that area. Um, I think, uh, again, it's down to aligning ourselves as to what we are. We can't be the band-aid for everything. I keep going on about it, but we can't. We have to go, go, especially going to the commissioners and say, we are going to do this. This is what's happening. We want you on board. It's really sad that you only had a 50% return on your letters that you sent out which is really sad that you said you sent out 62. If you've only got 30 coming back, you've got 30 people who aren't listening to you or don't want to engage. That's always a worry. Um, but from a staff perspective, one thing, I think it's really sad that only 10% of the collective staff of the organisation have been involved, which is what the numbers equate to, isn't it? Roughly three, 400. So I, don't, I know it's been a really good programme and it's really been pushed forward. And actually, I hear people talking about it, which is unusual. I think the screensaver thing is a really good idea as well. So all the screensavers now default to the, the scan, which is a great idea. Um, my big thing is about education. So the education is in the room. I know in Hertfordshire, they're predominantly around Hertfordshire University. It's the aviation industry. So I did some studying up there, and I noticed that they basically had bespoke aeronautical kind of courses. The, the companies went to them and said, this is what we want. So I know a lot of the universities do their paramedic course, but it's not fit for purpose. 
So I, I had a student the other day who was telling me, oh, well, my lecturers have told me I'm going to need to do lots of ECGs because I'll go to four cardiac arrests a day. So it's already a warped perspective of what we actually do. Um, and I just wonder if you had professional um, or sort of a conversation there and say, look, we're going to be the employer. 95% of paramedics come out of university going to the ambulance service. The rest go and do private work or whatever it might be. So why aren't we engaging with the universities and saying, actually, these are the factors that we really need. We need people who are really good at urgent care, who can manage wounds, who understand how to do more holistic overviews. The trauma and the Gucci and the nice stuff, or the exciting stuff, is such a small part of your job. All right, I, I'm spoiled because I do that, and that's what I've done for years. But it, And everyone aspires to do that. But actually, if you see um, someone who's an urgent care specialist and you see them in action... I'm in awe of them sometimes, and I don't like to say that because this <laughs> we don't always work well together. But actually, if you see someone who understands, actually, we don't need to say take this patient in. We can put them through to a frailty network or a, a, um, an emergency crisis team. It's it's brilliant. I don't know all those pathways. I fix mashed up people, but th to do that, and that is going to be the majority of our work. So why are we not teaching our people? It's not always our responsibility. It's not always, once they come to us, we then spend all the money and invest it. If we're the primary employer, why aren't we going to universities and saying, actually, these are the modules that we really, really need. This is what's really, really good, and this is what will, will help us in the future. It's just, sorry, that's just no, a... No, that's not the, point. That's the, board. That's the, that's the board challenge to the executive as well is to ensure that what we're doing is relevant to, you know, that, that we, we look at the whole picture, particularly around educational. So those points are being addressed, Nick, through, through the, and that's been part of the non-executive challenge, and you, you speak with passion on that, and I actually agree, we all agree with you. Uh, and um, But I think we, 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 are, we are engaging with all parties to ensure the strategy is, is relevant, but it's a long-term strategy. It's not going to be fixed in five minutes. It's, it's going to take time to implement this, but those points you make are, are, are very are very real, and Vanessa's point as well regarding uh, so, social care for sure. Martin, final comment. Oh, then we'll just give the education sector a chance to respond as well. Martin, we're asked and we agree that we're going to engage with the public in the period up to Christmas. So when I'm standing in Waitrose, I can see what I might be telling them. The question is, what am I asking them? Because, I mean, if you don't ask very focused questions, you'll get almost useless answers. You'll get, can I have absolutely everything, please? That's yes, that we take that away yeah. and we do a briefing for our governor colleagues. If those who are involved in discussions, let's, let's give them some, some steer. We've not already about how to... The, 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 what, we're, what we're talking about here uh, and also realistic about timescales of all this work. But the good point, Martin. Thank you. Well... Can I just, just respond then for HEIs? Uh, um, so in terms, of the, in terms of engagement for the strategy, we were one of the people who got the letters, um, so um, we've responded online, um, but more meaningfully than that, we've linked in um, with the team to come in and speak with the students, because obviously, as I highlighted before, students are key stakeholders here, so the students, and as we, we have... Um, an HEI partnership, an education partnership with CCAM representatives. So all of the universities that tra and further education colleges that train staff that come to you um, will have been invited. So the emails have all been shared. Just to, in terms of the curriculum, which is slightly longer term um, question, obviously the curriculum is driven by the regulatory and statutory bodies, so it's driven by the HCPC and the College of Paramedics, and the College of Paramedics are currently undergoing a huge review of their curricula at the moment, as you're probably aware, and they're feeding into that, and the Chief Allied Health Professional, Beth Harding, is um, that's like her top priority at the moment, so as and when the new curricula comes out, we'll respond to that. In the meantime, it's full of the things that we have to to deliver, but we certainly don't give out that message. And in fact, when we interview for places on the course, that is exactly what we say: is that it is not going to be lots of dramatic cardiac arrest. The mo more of your job is going to be related to the social care side and sorting out the complex needs. So we're very clear when we interview for places um, on the course. So um, yeah, and we have an ongoing partnership meeting. Um, 
with CCAM representatives, but I will just drop in here that the last meeting there were no CCAM representatives at that HEI education forum, so I had to sort of wear a CCAM hat for you, but it, you know, it's challenging. Yeah, no, it, it, do you mind if I just, very, one minute, um, yeah, I, it's not um, a direct criticism of the university, because I understand you're restrained by the, especially HCPC and the, the college paramedics who who also are going through a change and they're understanding now that what they're what they're telling you to teach is 20 years out of date because of the way we treat people clinical techniques things have jumped on in leaps and bounds so it's a new approach it's more of a generalist that's needed now people who are really good at that and then we bring them on a bit more once they come to us we bespoke it a, a little bit more but so, so it needs a structural change. And, and I'm really disappointed if we haven't attended any of these meetings because this is a massive thing moving forward, that everything is changing for, for, the, for the people on the front line to the way it's structured. Um, and it's all about engagement, isn't it? And if we're not there, then you can't engage. So sorry about that. <laughs> I'll ask someone to pursue that point around representation because, quite frankly, we do need to get totally engaged on this. I and mean, we're letting ourselves down in that situation. It, it is regrettable. So let's conclude. That's a very, very rich discussion. I think what we've heard today is a progress report of where we are. We've outlined the timescales. The board are very much working collectively on this. We've set up the best process we can. Um, uh, any other help we can give you as governors, the wider public and, and particularly points that Vanessa's made in particular regarding wider engagement and we can't be all things to all people and, and there are others who have got statutory responsibility to deliver their responsibilities and in many cases they're not. So there may be all kind of reasons for that and, and genuine reasons but nevertheless we do need to, we do need to ensure that um, we don't become the, the, the fall guys who were the victim in this, in this conversation as being able to be there for everybody. So thank you for that for that comments. Thank thank you, David. The presentation much appreciated. Can I move us on to the um, next items, the areas of assurance? Um, and we've got four four areas there: quality and patient safety. Tom, if you're receiving us loud and clear in Surrey, could you could you kindly just give an outline of your uh, of your report, please? Uh, yes, thank you.
question. Thank you, Tom. Any questions from Council regarding the uh, content? Pisa? Thanks, Chair. Um, Tom, we've lost you visually, so I hope you can hear me. Um, uh, I was interested in the reference in the August report to the to the takeaways from the Lucy Letby case. Um, and my understanding of that is not just whether staff had the confidence to raise concerns, but when they were raised, whether that was formally or through Datex or whatever, how they were dealt with. So um, do you have assurance that the that the uh, stock take that the executive were or are undertaking covers that side of it. So is there a is there a process under which complaints are evaluated and is there kind of what I would call the intelligence to understand when something potentially serious is raised and is properly dealt with? <laughs> Did you notice that bit of magic where, you know, I didn't move my lips and yeah. in fact I appeared to change yeah. gender temporarily? Yeah, yeah. That that's good. I see my talents are endless. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> um Really good question, Peter. And of course, the NIAS report and the Let Be uh, inquiry have, have shown things around freedom to speak up and the kind of cultural issues that have prevented people from speaking up or when they have spoken up, that those concerns were not addressed. And of course, we know here at CCAM as well, we've had some of those issues and we've worked hard and we've got lots of assurance now that actually it is uh, better resourced than it was previously. Um, and that uh, we have uh, support in terms of the data that shows us uh, and tells us a better, paints a picture around the amount of detriment that people might be suffering when they do speak up. And that's also a very important part uh, of what we need to look at here. Um, we do get the reports and they come to the audit committee uh, in terms of the process as well. But uh, both Tom and I look at 
aspects and elements of FTSU depending upon what the issues are that are being raised so that we can, if necessary, do a deep dive to keep an eye on the kinds of issues that are coming up. And of course, all the sorts of uh, training that we've put in place um, to ensure that people have a psychologically safe space. And that's what underpins it all, that people feel they are psychologically safe to speak up um, and that we can monitor that. And so that's why the training is so important in order to um, spread that message. So I, so I think in that sense, that was a very important part of it. And I think we, we are doing much better at that. And indeed, our Freedom to Speak Up guardian, Kim Blakeburn, um, meets with Simon uh, on a monthly basis as well. So not only has access to the board directly through me, but also uh, to the executive through Simon. And we are working on ensuring that investigations do proceed at pace and we do get the learning. We want to move away from blame and get into the learning space. I mean, just a further assurance on that. One thing I, Sean Swee's director's take, not executive's take, is that We've seen evidence that the chief executive has made a connection with our first line management, which has not been the case hitherto the two four. And part of that also, Tom mentioned leadership development and training. Um, and part of the, 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 the key to all of this is staff feel comfortable about their boss and they work in a psychologically safe environment and their, and their boss is someone's going to support them. Uh, and particularly when matters of concern are raised. And there's early days, yes, but we've got work, we've, there's always more work to do there. But we, we certainly, as there's, there's a there's a team of non-executives which we triangulated through our station visits where we are now more confident that area is improving. Still, much, there's still things to do, but we, we still feel more confident now. We've got much better connection with our frontline front line supervisory staff than we've had in the past. Martin. That one. A couple of questions, if I may. One's a quick one because I mean the chief executive covered this off to a degree. But you're assured now that your escalation to the board around call handling, that there's a robust plan in place to ensure improve continuous improvement over the coming months. That's the first one. The second one is I don't know where this lives because it's one of these things about how we play the IQR into this. So it may overlap several different committees. But somewhere I read that um, there was an issue around heart in that two teams of six operatives are supposed to be operational um, on duty 24-7. But that is only met 43% of the time in August due to various things like sickness and absence. So I don't know if that belongs with patient safety or with finance or with audit. Um, but I will try it on each one to see whether or not we get an answer. Just, just on the last point, Mark, it was in August. I was taking the report that there were 360 guardians and that was sitting in the panel and so on. That's not the way we should be seeing our attention at the moment. And we know that we have to get the issue off that issue and so we're taking the report to make sure it's in So we'll make sure that we're in the report to that and have that discussion. Thank you. Good point, Mr. Chairman. And we'll be kept informed. Of progress in, in that area. Um, on the other point, um, um, that your first point regarding the call handling, Tom, do you want to comment? Well, Tom's picked that up. If, if Tom can't speak, um, um, I'll jump in there for you, Martin. Um, oh, there's Tom. Yes. But I, 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 I wouldn't give that assurance. Um, so the, the board took um, in public session at its last meeting a comprehensive analysis presented by John O'Sullivan of what the issues were and what we needed to do to address it. So your question was, is there a plan? And there is. Do we now understand all the issues in play? Some of which are within our control and some as Tom's already alluded to, less so. And it will be receiving an update at its next board meeting on progress on those actions. So um, I am assured that there is a plan in place that understands the issues and is attempting to address them.
other questions of Tom as Chair of Quality and Patient Safety? Hopefully, I'll say a comprehensive report of the issues currently receiving the board's attention, uh, a number of which are coming back at the at the next the next board meeting, and then we'll obviously make sure the council is is fully appraised of outcome of that. Yeah. Can I suggest, even though we are behind time, I think we all need a short break. So, can I say one thing we can be on time on is our break. So, 11.45, so we're, we're one minute ahead of schedule. And then I ask you to return at 11.55, please. Can we all work together to finish the meeting by 12.30 in order for you to have some lunch before the afternoon session? So, uh, 10 minute break, and then we'll, we'll continue. <laughs> Yes, colleagues, can we reconvene, please? Before we recommence the meeting, we're just going to spend one minute with a very quick technical update. Sir, do you want to stand up and just explain a little bit about the technology? That's not. Failed the first attempt there. <laughs> so frustrating. Here we go. Right, Subo. The people. The people committee. Oops. Thank you, David. Um, so, people committee, a bit like uh, Tom, really. So, um, the paper that you've got uh, refers to a committee in September. We have had another since then in November. Um, so, I'm going to give you. Uh, six key points uh, from both committees. Um, I think we had some governors observing both of those committees, so uh, that was wonderful as well. Thank you. Um, so first of all, to uh, talk a little bit about time to hire, um, we've, we've talked a lot about recruitment uh, and retention uh, previously, so we did want to focus very much on the time to hire, um, and it's currently running at around 109 days. Um, so we explored the target, and a target of 60 days uh, is what they're looking at. The NHS average is about 44 days, so we did ask and challenge around that question, uh, around 60 days to us still feels a bit too long, uh, and what can we do to bring that down uh, a little bit more? Um, so that's really around ad hoc recruitment is the 60 days, uh, and of course we do have to follow um, you know, all the pre-employment checks as well as per normal, and that does take time, uh, but nevertheless there is that challenge uh, around reducing that target. Um, we also talked a bit about appraisals. So we're currently running at around 58% completion against a target of 85%. Um, we know that we're not going to hit that 85% uh, by the end of the year. Um, so that concerns us. Um, however, we were not assured because the data that we had uh, at the committee really uh, didn't seem to us to be robust and reliable. So we have asked that we get the reliable data that's been verified uh, so that we can uh, make certain of what the actual figures are. Uh, and if that confirms our view that we are going to be still off that target, uh, then that will be a board escalation. The, encouragingly, we did uh, find, and I just found out, I think, today, that um, the staff survey response rate is about 60%, um, so that's very good. Uh, we did talk about the pulse survey uh, results, which give you a flavour of, of how things are going, and there were some green shoots there, but the uh, staff survey uh, results so far are 60%, so that's, that's really positive. We had a conversation, important conversation, about the professional standards unit, um, at uh, People Committee as well. And of course, it's a multi-professional uh, workforce that we have here at CCAM. I don't think we got any assurance at all about the Professional Standards Unit, uh, really, and how it's operating. 
But Rachel has assured us that she is doing a review of that unit and that will come back to People Committee and we will look at um, its form, function, purpose and really what uh, its fundamental role is. You'd think it would be fundamental at CCAM, so uh, it's good that she is doing uh, a review of that. Um, we also looked at the EOC 111 uh, culture. Now, we're not assured on this at the moment because the paper was deferred from September. It was due to come in November. There was no paper in November either. Um, and so I'm not able to give any assurance on that. I would like to see it um, because I would like to see exactly what is happening uh, around the culture. As you know, there's a lot of uh, attention and resource focused on getting that right. Um, so I can't give the assurance on that at the moment. What was uh, encouraging is that there's about 43% achievement around um, the housekeeping items, the quick wins and actions, you know, to correct some of those things that have come out of previous staff surveys. So that's uh, positive. Um, just in terms of grievances and disciplinaries, just a small point, really. And I think one thing that does seem to have changed, and it seems like a small thing, but I think it's quite fundamental, there seems to be more informal resolution of grievances and disciplinary. So before they escalate into the formal process, there are real efforts being made to resolve them much earlier and informally. So I think that's um, all to the good. Um, in terms of the IQR and the BAF, um, I think there, for, for the committee, I think, and looking at some of the data, I think there is a discrepancy between the IQR and the BAF. I think the risk rating on the BAF, uh, for me personally, looks very optimistic. Um, and I think I would like to see more correlation and alignment between uh, the IQR and the BAF uh, going forward. And then lastly, um, and this is not in the report, although Simon has referred to it in his uh, uh, Chief XX report, there was a health and safety executive inspection uh, recently. And uh, the outcome of that um, is that we have been issued with both a notice of contravention uh, and an improvement notice. And these are around some key things. The improvement notice is specifically around um, training of our staff around bariatric training and uh, use of bariatric equipment uh, for our patients. Uh, the notice of contravention covers uh, a number of things, including the bariatric training, but also how we do um, our manual handling training um, and how we do uh, our training around violence and aggression, de-escalation training, online versus face-to-face. -face. The feeling is that online is inadequate um, for uh, the kind of work that we do. Similarly, around risk assessments, perhaps that we are not curious enough uh, and informed enough around how we do our risk assessments, and we need to be uh, more on the ball about that. And sort of delving into that, we haven't done uh, some training around risk assessments uh, for health and safety, perhaps for about three years. So there's uh, further work to do on that. And again, um, in conversations with Margaret, um, health and safety is going to uh, undertake a review. I think that's appropriate. And I've asked that we see both the formal report from the HSC and also the outcome of the review into health and safety at the next People Committee in January. I think that's all, Chair. Thank you, Zua. Comprehensive report. Thank you. Any questions about the report? Noting some items still still to come to the to the board meeting. Martin, um, and then Kirsty. Thank you. <laughs> I wouldn't remember if Howard didn't keep pointing at it. Um, um, and you may have mentioned it in the context of recruitment, in which case I apologise. But but there's a line on uh, page 24 of, of the report which goes back to the what went to the board in October about the committee reinforcing the will of the board to ensure a development of a retention plan that's brave and ambitious. Are you assured that such a plan is in place? Oh, I've got to do my... Oh, it's working. Uh, there we are. Yep. Thanks. Um, yes, I think there was a plan. So there's a, a bit more to this. There was an initial plan, uh, but we didn't get the assurance that, in fact, it was delivering what it said it was going to deliver. 
And so uh, we asked them to go away and take another look at this. And um, there was some uh, board development sessions as well around the re retention plan. Um, and what we have now is a more robust retention plan, I think, which has also engaged staff. And there's, uh, I understand, a very high level of engagement with staff with webinars being run and staff being uh, involved in that. So I think we have more assurance there that we have a more robust uh, retention plan. Um, so I've got two things actually. So one was on appraisals actually. So um, as a directorate, we know there is an issue with the data, the integrity, and you've just alluded to it actually about the data. Because we know our team leaders, specifically our critical care team leaders, they have done their appraisals, but actually that's, somehow that is not pulling through. And I, I want to think that we're more than the 60% because actually I think as a directorate, we know we are more because we've actually seen those appraisals complete but they're not showing us a complete on ESR so there clearly is an issue between what we're seeing what the, our, our team leaders and our managers are seeing on ESR when it shows us complete and what is then showing on actual ESR in the background from the reporting which is pulled through from BI so I'd really like some assurance that we are going to properly look at why we've got that discrepancy because there is quite a significant discrepancy that if we're seeing it in medical then I would imagine it's across all of the teams, but I'm happy to pick up with you offline what we're seeing so that that might feed into some of the questions. So there's that. And then my other was obviously you stole my thunder with the health and safety. Um, I just want to seek some assurance that we are going to train our, co our most complex patients being the bariatric patients. We've had this equipment now for, since 2012. I think we brought this equipment in back into 2011. And the majority of our staff will have, they'll have seen it in probably the odd job that they do um, but I just want to seek some assurance that we are going to take that training seriously in the fact that we're going to get the right people trained to use that kit because if we're going to injure a patient or a member of staff it's going to be on a bariatric job because the kit is so complex I just want to seek some assurance really Can I? Uh, we know we know the comments, and I think as a obviously non-executives, we'll have a separate conversation with the chief executive regarding is the number of bubbling pot issues. As Simon 
um, refers to. And this is one we just need to crack, quite frankly, in terms of the general auspices of people management. So we will make sure that is uh, gets even more attention than it's had. Do you have a second? Is it, have you answered? Yeah. The... Yep. Okay. Andrew. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to ask Subu if um, she was satisfied that she's getting the support from the executive team in HR in respect to these matters. The fact that the appraisal system, you know, is another series of reasons why, as opposed to actually we're going to fix it and we're going to do it, uh, is an issue. I think the time to hire in an environment where we already know we've got a huge deficit in the number of people we can recruit. We're in a difficult area to recruit. We've heard that from the chief executive earlier. Uh, and we're still talking about 109 days. I mean, it's just extraordinary. It could take a third of a year nearly to actually get someone on board when we're in an environment where we are struggling to find people. You know, if they walk in through the door, we want them on board as quickly as possible. And even 60 days, to me, I completely agree with you, seems very poor. So are you assured that you're getting the support and the truthful answers from the HR department that you would expect to see as a non-executive? <laughs> I think it's fair to say that one of the issues is the quality of the papers that comes to the committee. And that has been a work in progress for some 18 months to the extent that I have pre-meetings um, with some of the exec, you know, for an hour to go through each of the papers. And then I have to send some papers back because I don't think that they are making the link between risk and assurance. So there is a problem around the quality of the information that comes to the committee in the first place. And that makes our job much harder to do. Um, and I think some of that is around issues that we've discussed before, you know, how well are people being trained and supported to write papers that are appropriate for committee? Um, do they understand the link between risk and assurance and that our job is to seek that assurance? Um, I don't think we're quite there yet, but things have improved considerably from where they were 18 months ago. Um, so I think the information is getting better. I think it is an organisational challenge to focus on the data. You know, there are a number of nerds um, in the NED space and we, we like figures, we like numbers, we like to look at these sorts of things. Um, and I like people to tell me the evidence in the figures. And I don't think that is a, a, a sort of practice that people are used to in the organisation generally. They sort of focus very much on finance as focusing on numbers. And actually, when you talk about people and culture, I like to see numbers. A good case in point to illustrate that is the culture dashboard. Now, the culture dashboard is starting to look very, very good. Um, but it's taken quite some time to focus their minds on getting the data to be the bedrock of how you produce that dashboard. So I think it's a work in progress, Andrew, is a short answer to your question, but it's, it's improving.
I agree with your analysis of the framework. Is Subo sure that in that training that they're getting, that one the importance of one to one dialogue is really being understood? And that that program is really in the course of being given priority? Um, yes, I In terms of uh, do they get the messages that you have know, one to one with their team uh, to 
water. Um, and I think from a different way to work is not really, to me, just that's really basic. You know, the, you just talk about it, you can see it in whatever way that is, you know, it doesn't have to be very very funny, it's not just one of the things, it's quite a lot of challenges with us having a good way So, uh, yes, I'm, I'm sure that the content of the training is as it should be. Uh, and yes, I'm sure that the training is being rolled out uh, in the way that they would like it to be faster, but it needs to be rolled out. Um, I don't have the assurance, as Sam has said, that we are signed up to doing this. Now, we all say, well, actually, what we do is say, just do it. Because it's, it's a directive, and that's our modern or way of working with the plan. It's essentially exactly. Like, just do it, get the one to one in. But you're right, you know, it's the quality of the interaction that. I suspect that the first phase is that you get to have it and do it. And then you start looking at the work is and you start looking at the moderation of it. Okay, go ahead, move us on. I was simply going to say have you observed any of the actual delivery? Kirsty, can you comment on that? Yeah, so I've done the fundamentals course. Um, and actually, it's probably one of the best courses I've ever done in the 20 years that I've been in the NHS. Purely on the basis that it talks about the people. So it's not talking about the, doing the act. It's talking about having the conversation. Don't care how you have the conversation, just have the conversation. And it's about bringing out the best of the person that you are appraising. It's, it's totally your colleague, staff member, it's the people focus that they drive with that course. So actually, yes, I I, I do think we put on to some extent. And I just think it's giving the managers the time to do it. And that's probably where some of the disconnect potential could be. But from the eighteen people that were on my course, every single one of us took something away. And there was something like eighty years of experience on my course. So, yeah. That's really good to think when you seek that feedback. And also I think it also highlights the point. She's definitely making the guardian the strategy of the organisation. But quite frankly, the organisation has been running too hot for too long. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, we put patients, people put patients first. As a consequence, other things go by the wayside because they want that sort of control. That's why we go into the spiral of decline. That's why we need to check that. That's part of the course of change, which is going to take time to think about. But he's, he's, I feel now more confident. He's now underway. And I agree, that's really great feedback, Kirsty. One final question on this, though, really was. Ooh, um, I would talk about appraisals. <laughs> I'd go on for hours, but um, I won't. I'll ask you a singular question. Um, a couple of uh, cog meetings ago, I asked if you had um, assurance and an understanding of uh, the trust current position with the longevity of grievances and disciplinaries and the ones that had been going on for far too long. Um, I've got personal experiences of it, not personally, uh, but people I know who've come to me and I've discussed them with you and they're still not resolved. And these are like over 12 months now. So um, I just wonder if you can actually say you have assurance that the process is good if it's taking that long for some of these things to be resolved. I would say that um, I don't think I have the assurance that it is coming down uh, as fast as we would like it to. It's going in the right direction um, and uh, there is, I'm assured that there is real effort in bringing the time down. I think what influences and impacts that is that the number of cases keeps rising. So as soon as you know the, the number drops and actually then they're able to shorten the time because there's only so much capacity in the team, um, then the number of cases starts to rise again and then the time increases. So I think um, with the arrival of a new head of operations, I think there's some real expertise in that team and uh, I think really upskilling some members in that team, real efforts have been made to, to restructure that team. I think we will start to see uh, more speed uh, in bringing that uh, time scale down. So I, I think...
to get to a point where they actually go sick because it's having that much of an impact on them. And then because there's no resolution, their only other, they just want resolution. And then the other resolution is then you have been the information is put more work over on the HR department or that they put in their own form of anti grievance to not put in policy. So I think um, it, it, it's a massive important. Thanks, Nick. If I, if, if I may, just to draw on that bit of the, the people section of the discussion, well, the Chief Executive and I do, though, Sam and I do network, though, with other our compatriots in other parts of the UK Ambulance Service, and this is an issue that is common to all ambulance trusts. It's not, I'm not excusing the issue, we need to, it needs to improve, period. Nevertheless, it is a, a particular cultural challenge of the ambulance sector at this time across the, across the country, and uh, we need to break it. And that goes back to, I think you've had a number of strands from my colleagues, particularly what Subo was saying around people management, training developments, freedom to speak, well, there's a whole load of work going on here as part of the culture plan, which I think I think in time we'll have we'll have impact we'll have more impact in CCAM, but there's still more to do here for sure. Let's can we move on now to the finance um, section? Uh, Howard, I can ask for a relatively brief but relevant report, please. Do that. Uh, the efficiency target you may recall was 9 million. Uh, this figure refers to the 5.3 million um, being the latest estimate. I take that to 6.4 million of the 9 million. So we're still forecasting short um, from the efficiency perspective, but we are assured that we can meet the uh, break even position basically because there are some reserves that can be uh, deployed to, to help, help us get there. So that's a very good uh, position to be in. Um, other key points uh, we had um, a paper on benchmarking, uh, and we've got another one coming up on Thursday the patient level costing information, which uh, I find very useful and interesting in analysing our cost base and our relative position uh, to the other ambulance services. Uh, we had a paper on the um, uh, IT review and we were, uh, that was an update last time and we've got an update uh, on Thursday uh, which we, we already covered. We had a paper on the Medway um, benefits realisation plan so that's really good. Uh, structure framework to monitor the realization of the benefits now that Medway has been delivered. Um, on estates uh, maintenance um, disposals, we were assured in terms of the statutory compliance um, and uh, the, the repairs position on that, so that was good. Um, and then um, we you will now recall we have picked up the operational performance, so we had a very good paper on that. Uh, and uh, I think we've covered the rise of a very good position on
Well, if, if, if I may, though, this is a wider issue in the finance department. This is, this is more of a wider cultural issue for all NHS organisations. The cost efficiency is not the province of the finance director. It's the province of the people who spend the money. The finance director, the greater respect to their talents, is calculating how the money is being spent. It needs, needs the drive in the organisation. And that's something which all NHS organisations struggle with. But we've got to change that. But I need to, can, can we keep just moving on? Uh, Harvey? Then, then Kirsty. Um, there was mention of, um, I think it was 600 invoices that hadn't been, that were unmatched. They were worth about £4 million in total. And what, um, there was talk about a plan to address this. We have some assurance that that plan has now come to fruition and they've been addressed. Um, we certainly had an update um, since then that they have. Um, come down substantially. Uh, I don't know the latest position, but I, I will ask uh, on Thursday to uh, see where we're at. Thank you. Jesse? Yes, it's worked. Um, so mine is probably it's for both Howard and Subar, and probably for the board as a whole. Just mentioned apprenticeship programs. Can I just be assured that we're going to take the learning from the clinical education apprenticeship programs and the issues we had with Ofsted and the regulations and all of that before we even engage and start to look at apprenticeships for vehicle maintenance technicians? We got ourselves into some serious hot water in 2019, and I just don't want us to go back there. So, can I just seek some assurance that we take the learning from that experience and those reports to make sure that if we're going to do it, we do it right this time? A section of the strategy that looks at our emerging workforce, how we create apprentice schemes for those people. Absolutely. Of course, there has to be because the thought that we can find these people out there is just it's not real. I don't know what the learning is, but I'm very happy to have a conversation with you about what went wrong well previously. But more broadly, um, I will be coming back through boards and committees in December and January with my view of. The structure that is required to support the strategy. In my line of sight is the need to review how and in what way we do education as a thematic issue rather than getting into the detail of it now. And so I would just simply say, rest assured that it's not to do that. But I think Kirsty made a very important point in terms of again, part of the culture of the organisation. Um, we shouldn't leave our step.
Can I move this off? Assurance also around um, the, the way in which the organisation seeks to manage and tackle fraud or poor behaviour that can result in a bad case of public money. That control environment is sound. But there are some systemic issues that I think we need to continue to address, and I think they will be tackled by all the initiatives that uh, Simon has put in place. So over the last year, Brian referred to uh, the media of digital. Um, I would also say that some of the issues that come out of the report from the Manchester Broad team relate to the lack of coherent policies in HR. So if you take those together, what they suggest is the organisation has got some way to go in terms of the functional support that it has within its corporate services to support our Again, I would stress that uh, Simon is on this. So the role of the organization will be, as I mentioned, in relation to digital, is to see where these reviews are identified, ways in which we need to improve. We actually ensure that those improvements are delivered, the actions are taken. And that's going to be very much the focus of the committee coming forward. But one point I would say, and I would really, really support what Simon said. We are on a journey here, and we know what we need to do. We're getting a better strategy in place. We know what we need to do with our functional support areas uh, and the costs of our management learning and a sustainable uh, learning culture. But as a council, I think we hardly need to hold some account and recognise this is not being done overnight. It's important that we can demonstrate that the organisation is achieved. And I, I'd say, you know, we're looking at a year to an 18 Questions from Michael at that point. Hopefully you concur with what he's saying. So we receive, I'm happy to receive that report. Thank you. Um, time is marching on. And can I ask, this, in the, the next item, I'm not wishing to underline any of the excellent work going on in the subcommittees, there are one or two things we just need to sign off in terms of her approval. Um, and then, but if I can ask, by exception, if we can take any other bits of this from that. Um, the, the, the terms of reference for the um, membership Development Committee need approving. David, are you proposing those? Yes, I'm proposing these. It's in your uh, pack. Uh, so what I'm uh, if uh, you have any objections, um, can we take the terms of reference as being accepted? You've all scrutinised the terms of reference. Can we do follow what it says, as referred to earlier? Sorry, sorry, Brian, you've lost me there. Sorry, no objection to the terms of reference, but we need to follow the terms of reference in terms of regular reports to count. Well, is there anything by exception from your membership report you wish to, wish to bring to the Council? 
That's the point I was making. So is there anything we need right. to bring out from the, the report? Okay, thank you. Um, nomination committee, that, that's there for your information. I, I'd just like to say, um, I think... Inclusive process in true sea capital tradition. Um, Governor Development Committee, you need to not hear any from that report. Um, my so, uh, I'm obviously Deputy League Governor, um, so I've asked because Lee's obviously not able to attend today. Um, nothing significant, just ask for them to be noted really and for the, for the Council of Governors to accept those as. There's a couple of things I just wanted to point out quickly. Um, page 45 to 47 is the training for our Governors for the next, and that starts from April, and that's, that's there. The first session is this afternoon, so I'd just welcome everybody to try and attend those. Um, the... Uh, we've got hold into account this afternoon session, which is fine. Um, also, can I just encourage governors that haven't and those that have also to pick up shadowing shifts for call handlers, both operational and EOC, um, and also for QAVs for those that haven't managed to attend one of the QAVs yet. They are really, really good. Um, and Jody, is that a link for that? Um, governors Take that one away. I, my, my, I think there's. A, I take the general point about relevance of information, uh, but we are looking at long-term trends in these meetings, not just things that happened in the last last few weeks. Um, and there is some issue around timetabling. And I think we need to do some further work here in terms of the organisation of the meeting and looking at the diary going forward. So it might well be I'm asking the the, the council's forbearance that possibly we keep with the dates because I think to change the dates I can anticipate some real difficulties with that. Quite frankly, um, given other people have made arrangements around these dates, which should notify 12 months in advance, um, but with a, with an understanding that we will look at the timetable from April, from April onwards to try and get them into better synchronisation. I think. That that would be a, an acceptable compromise. As for your patience, there, I think that way we get things get get things sorted in the in the right way. I think. Yeah. Right. Um, anything else in the governor activities and queries reports? You've, you've raised one issue, Martin. Anything else that to be brought from that? Okay. And the annual members meeting. We need to 
approve the minutes of that meeting which are before you. Are you happy to approve those minutes? Uh, that you, you, most of you were there. Okay, thank you. Can I suggest, in order to get your session to start on time, because you've got a holding to account session to start soon, I think in theory in, in nine minutes, and there's still lunch to be served. So can I say we can close the meeting now, um, and um, the date of next meeting remains the 14th of March, and the Bamstead is it?